Hey, what's up? This is Kevin from Kevin's Barbecue Joints, and in this episode, I was lucky enough to talk to Steve Delinsky from ABC7 Chicago, The Hungry Hound. He's also known for the Feed podcast that he does with Rick Bayless, which is one of my favorite podcasts. It's incredible. He has such a wealth of knowledge. He has 13 James Beard Awards. Unheard of. It's amazing. Uh, if you want to know any, anything about Chicago food and the Chicago food trends, talk to Steve Delinsky and I talked to him about Chicago barbecue and he gives a ton of information about the history of Chicago barbecue up to the present, what restaurants he's going to, ones off the beaten path, the different meats they're smoking at these places, what they do right, what they do wrong. I really think you'll enjoy it and if you do like what you see, please subscribe, but please enjoy this episode. Thank you. Well, good morning. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, do you have a busy day ahead of you? Um, I do. I'm going to uh, check out the new Goose Island uh, brew pub, brew house, storage facility, and then I'm going to take a look at their new brew pub. Oh, really cool. And then I'm going to probably check out a new uh, Russian Pelmeni dumpling place in Lincoln Park. Oh, nice. And tonight I'm going to check out uh, two new places next to each other in the Google building in the West Loop. Um, one is from... Uh, Jim Meehan, who started PDT in New York City, okay. he is originally from Oak Park here in the suburbs, oh, yeah. and uh, they've got a new cocktail place, and then next door to it is a place called Regards to Edith, which uh, apparently has a $19 Chicago Italian beef. <laughs> so I'm not sure if they make it with Wagyu or what, but- It sounds uh, like they must do something like that, right? Yeah, I'm checking that out uh, tonight. Oh, excellent. Are you going to be posting that online? Do you, or do you post a, like, as you go, or do you usually do it a couple days later? Or do you... uh, It depends. I will probably post something on Instagram tonight if it's if it's good, if it's notable. Mm -hmm. um, I might put something on my website about it if I really like it. And then if I truly believe in it, I will call them up in a couple of days and then set up a time to go back with a camera and shoot something for ABC. Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, I wanted to talk to you about Chicago barbecue and how – sort of how it's transformed and changed over the years since, because you've, you've lived in Chicago your entire life or you've or just your business life. I, I don't know. I don't know your, I don't know your history as deeply as I'd want to. How did you get your start? I moved here from, um, well, I'm originally from Minneapolis okay. and I worked my way around the Midwest in a couple of small markets, um, upper Michigan and Iowa. And then I got to Chicago in 92, uh, worked for the Tribune company. They, they still have uh, CLTV, which is Chicagoland Television. Mm -hmm. It's their sort of local version of CNN, kind of 24-hour news channel. And I did news reporting for them for uh, probably two years. And then in 95, uh, we launched the Good Eating Show that the Tribune was, was launching in conjunction with the newspaper. They were rebranding it, uh, the food section. And so the Good Eating section was coming out, and we were doing this companion TV show and I became the producer of that show and worked with the Tribune's food staff every week to, to create this weekly half-hour show. And we did 52 shows a, week, a year, which oh, wow. is unheard of in 95, 96. <laughs> yeah, no one was doing that. The Food Network had launched in like 93, 94. That's so what I was going to say. I think it was 93, 94, yeah. So we were doing the Good Eating Show. And, and the good thing about that was I was um, really getting on-the-job training. It was kind of my trial by fire. I'd, every week I would be in somebody else's kitchen uh, we did recipe segments from the Tribune's test kitchen with the test kitchen director. We did wine reviews with William Rice, oh. uh, who was the wine columnist. We did cheap eats. So I covered kind of the whole gamut. And, you know, Chicago, mid 90s, there was a lot of Charlie Trotter, but we had a lot of, we've always had a lot of great ethnic food. And so that's kind of what I always gravitated toward uh, kind of the little neighborhood gems, mom and pops. And I did that show for about eight years. And um, while I was doing that, I just started pitching myself. <laughs> As a food reporter, I called up public radio and I pitched some stories and I became their food correspondent. And I pitched uh, CS Magazine and Michigan Avenue Magazine and would write reviews and do profiles for the Chicago Reader, which is the weekly independent here. So I, I kind of – food kind of came my niche and my, my beat. Mm -hmm. And then when I canceled the show in 2003 – um, I just decided I'm not going to go back into news because they, they, they wanted me to go back into news reporting. And I said, by then I'd been doing food for gosh, eight years. <laughs> yeah. so I'm not going to be covering the FBI press conferences anymore. <laughs> so I, um, I shot myself around as a food reporter to all of the news directors in town. And, uh, lo and behold, ABC and NBC were both interested in doing something. And so they offered me part-time gigs 
which led to more, I went to ABC because they're the number one in the market. And then I just led to, I was doing up to four pieces a week for ABC. And they just like the fact that, you know, I'm not a, a restaurant critic. I'm not going in anonymously. I'm on a television. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't be anonymous. So I'm not reviewing restaurants per se, but I am looking for stories or unique angles or interesting dishes or ingredients or techniques that people maybe not, haven't heard about. And so it's kind of my job to inform them about, you know, what is in their neighborhood, what's in their community. Um, so I've been doing the, it's called the Hungry Hound mm -hmm. segment, you see, for 14 years. And I still do occasional freelance for the Chicago Tribune's travel section or the Globe and Mail in Canada for their travel section. Um, I still, I do a podcast actually. So I, the radio gig led to the creation of a podcast called the feed podcast. Yeah. I love that podcast. Hey, thanks. And I do that with Rick Bayless every mm -hmm. Thursday, we drop a new show. So we do literally 51 shows a year for that. Well, you're a busy guy, huh? <laughs> I managed to stay busy. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot going on in Chicago. You know, the, the, the sad thing is that as much as there is going on here and as much interest and demand as there is, mm -hmm. The publications just cannot support full-time food journalism here. It's really difficult. I mean, the Tribune's made an investment in it, and they've got a pretty robust staff. But, man, everybody has been just cut to the bone. Yeah, and it, and it seems like Chicago, of any city, would, hap, would, would be able to support that. But I guess it's, it, it's a different time these days. And also, that's, I guess that's kind of why you do a, a number of different things, too, because you're passionate about food, and you want to make sure that you cover it. Well, and you... And you hope that one of those things hits, like, you know, I'm working on creating a food podcast network and I'm working on another podcast without Rick Bayless just by myself. And so trying to create something that, you know, gets some traction and builds an, an audience and gets advertiser support and all that good stuff. And I'm able to make a living doing it. And, and how, how do you, do you enjoy doing the podcast? Is that something that's it's a difficult thing or is it is it really time consuming? I, I've never done a podcast before and I know that certain certain ones do take up a lot of time. Um, you know, it depends. I mean, for us, we have uh, a friend of mine who was a, a producer editor at WBEZ, which is the public radio station here I used to work at. Uh, he edits our show every week. So we get together. We're, we're very efficient with our time. We do like seven shows in one day. Oh, oh wow. I plan, I plan way in advance. So like late, uh, late November, we're doing our next round and that will take us through, you know, into January. Um, so we don't do it. Every, we're not like getting together every week, but we yeah, are hoping that we can get everything together in one day. Because yeah, I and, imagine Rick was busy too. I was just trying to figure out how you coordinate that. He's yeah, crazy busy. Uh, but I will say that you know every now and then, like Alice Waters is in town, and that doesn't fall on a day we're taping. And so then I'll reach out to his assistant, and we coordinate our schedules, and we just make sure that we're available for you know an hour. Yeah, on a Thursday. Alice Waters, you sort of yeah, you, we make, you want yeah, to we be make, available. Of course, you know, and we had the the co-author from Modernist Bread was just in town on book tour, so we we interviewed Francisco Magoya also. So we do make exceptions, but um, to answer your question, it is difficult just in terms of organization. Um, we do try to we want to do a new show every week. We want to be regular with that, so that does require a lot of planning on my part. I've got an intern who helps a little bit. Um, we've invested in some good microphones. Literally, the microphone that I'm talking on right now, I just cracked open out of the box. These are these new Shure microphones. I'm trying to see if, if I like these. So hopefully they sound good. It does. Um, the quality sounds really good. And it, that is important. Sound, I, I've realized I need to up my sound game. <laughs> I mean, it's a podcast. That's all you have to rely on is mm -hmm. the sound, right? So you've got to really have good sound. Um, and, you know, just a quiet environment and a, a good mixer. And I mean, it doesn't require a lot of equipment, though. I went to the podcast convention in Anaheim in August, okay. and there were several hundred people there. And, and a lot of them had just been starting out, but there were a lot of, there's like a marketplace of vendors selling the equipment. And it doesn't, you can get in for under a thousand bucks and kind of build a show. Oh, wow. And I, I, I think I want, I'd love to do that too, because I think that's important. I think, especially in the barbecue world, I know there are some guys that are kind of jumping in, but I, I, I love talking to people, and I, I think I could also translate this to a podcast. Yeah, I mean, a barbecue. I, I'm I'd be surprised if there's not a barbecue podcast already. There's a couple. There's a couple that are. I think there's one that's there. There's two or three, and they're all mostly Texas based. Of course. Yeah, which makes sense. That's people yeah. do love yeah, their yeah, Texas. The Carolinas, you know, that somebody in Kansas City could do something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, I think Chicago is a weird and interesting barbecue landscape. Yeah, let's um, jump into that. I'd love to talk about that. Okay. You want to talk about Chicago barbecue? I would love to. Yes, definitely. Okay. So, so when well, you when you first started out, how has it changed? Well, if you go back to the origins of Chicago barbecue and you think about like the Great Migration, African Americans coming up here for jobs mm -hmm. in the 
40s and early 50s. And so a lot of them settled in Bronzeville, which is on the south side of the city. Um, not that far, actually, just north of Hyde Park, where the University of Chicago is. And a lot of these barbecuers were coming from, Mem uh, from, Me from I'm sorry, from Tennessee and from Mississippi For and sure. from Georgia. And so they brought with them this style that we call it aquarium style smoking. Um, and I don't, th I don't know if this existed in Mississippi or, or Arkansas, but a lot of the pit masters I noticed in Chicago, like Honey One Barbecue or Lems or Leon's, have these aquarium style smokers. Now, do you know what those are? I honestly don't know. Please, please tell me. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So it is essentially a, um, a large rectangular box, and there are window panes on both sides that slide open. Um, I think they're glass, okay. you know, not glass, uh, so you can see all of the, you can see the, the grill, mm -hmm. and then um, the product goes on top of the grill, and it's typically links, ribs, and tips mm -hmm. and chicken, yeah. but it's a lot of links and tips. Definitely. Oh yeah, that's that's all I read about. And that's all I've had. It's an expensive cut, but it's got a lot of fat and a lot of flavor, and so that sits right on top of the grill. And then the the fire is directly below it. There is no offset here because yeah. it's all in this one vertical rectangular space. And so you've got all this wood blazing underneath the product. You think it would burn it, so you always have to have a hose right next to it and they're, the pit master is constantly hosing down the wood to tame the flames. Oh, that's so interesting. But it's still got all this smoke coming off throughout the day and so it still takes about two to three hours to do ribs um, but they're, they're never doing brisket. Mm. They're never doing pork shoulder. It's just too hot. Definitely. So it, that's why you just see the, the lynx tips and ribs and um, when they um, – and then you know, there's a the vertical sort of um, uh, exhaust out the top of the building. And so um, you're constantly opening and closing the glass. You're constantly checking. You're moving. You're turning. Um, when they plate, it's kind of interesting. I have to ask for sauce on the side. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, this never comes up in, in Hill Country in Texas or in the Carolinas probably. But if you say nothing and you just order like a full rack of ribs or an order of tips, it will come. And they'll chop it up, you know, individual pieces um, in a styro white styrofoam clamshell. And then they'll cover it with sauce. Uh, and I don't like the Chicago style sauce, like a sweet baby Ray's. It's got sugar in it. It is very it's sweet. Very sweet. Um, and cloying. And I think, you know, covers up any kind of beauty, you know, deliciousness you have, the sort of that you cover that smoke ring. Anyway, so you cover it with sauce and then you put French fries on top of that. Uh, <laughs> no, wait a second. You put white bread on top of that. Okay. That serves as a divider and then some wax paper and then french fries and then sometimes they put sauce on top of the fries too and then close up the clamshell it's a little bit it's a definitely a starch bomb um i always just say no no bread no fries because the fries are never hand cut mm -hmm. uh, and twice fried so i just say no bread no fries and sauce on the side and sauce on the side but do the you use the sauce at all or is it something that you eh, it's an accent barely mm -hmm. i don't think it really needs it um there's just a lot of fat and gristle in the in the tips there's a lot of flavor in there and the links don't need really mm -hmm. anything at all um, so that's kind of the Chicago South Side style. Uh, you know, so that's did, that's based. That was a South Side style. That's South Side for sure. That is, but you know, that's Chicago style barbecue because when you think about Chicago and you go back in the history, there was no North Side. Mm -hmm. I mean, people weren't barbecuing on the North Side. That all came from African Americans, Great Migration, South Side, Bronzeville, especially. Gotcha. So there are still a handful of places left. Not very many. A lot of them have closed, which is kind of sad. Yeah, definitely. Um, but but you know there are second generations coming on now. Like Leon's has their sec their offspring is now reopening Leon's. I've heard Lem's daughters um, installed a new smoker on 75th Street, and they're going to try to make it an another go at it. I guess um, they've been open. I just don't think they've been that great. Okay. So, well, so how about Honey One? Is it? And Honey One is on 43rd Street. Yeah, they do a nice still job. Still there, right? Lee Bronzeville, actually. Okay. Um, and Robert, the owner, is from Arkansas, and he and his son own that place. They used to be on the north side for a while. Did not. It wasn't a great location, not good foot foot traffic, and so I think they're more appreciated in Bronzeville. And again, ribs, tips, links, maybe chicken, and that's about it. Um, and not a lot of sides, maybe coleslaw and beans. And when did you see the new, the maybe the north side places start to open up, or or at what point was it were things kind of changing in the barbecue scene? Well, for many years, if you go back to the 70s or 80s, there's a place called Twin Anchors mm -hmm. in Lincoln Park, which I am not a fan of. I'm not even really sure who is. Uh, they don't smoke their ribs. They're they're baked and they're or they're boiled or they're steamed. I mean, there's no they're gray. There's not really. I a think smoke. they're boiled. That's whatever. 
they're boiled. Yeah, that which I mean, really, that's barbecue. Um, it's like it looks like I mean, it's it's a quirky, fun little. It's an offshoot. It's like a looks like a Wisconsin supper club. You know, it's got the the hams clock in the wall and the and a dartboard, whatever. It's it's kitschy and fun and like it's a throwback. But you don't go there for barbecue. So that's been around. Like when I moved here in the early '90s, it was all about Twin Anchors for ribs and Carson's was another place. Oh for yeah, ribs. Carson's. Yeah, okay. Again, I think you know, kind of like average. Um, mediocre ribs, nothing really to, to write home about. But about 10, at least 10, if not maybe a couple of years, maybe 12 years ago, smoke came on the scene. Yeah, smoke seemed to, that, that got on my radar for sure. And that's S M O Q U E. Mm-hmm. These are three guys who are in tech who kind of got, you know, like a lot of stories, they got uh, disenchanted with what they were doing. Mm-hmm. And uh, Barry Sorkin is one of the guys who's kind of been the spokesperson for the trio. And um, they wrote a manifesto and they said, this is what, you know, barbecue should be, what we think it should be. And, you know, it should not fall off the bone. You know, we think if something should fall off the bone, it probably shouldn't come on a bone. (laughs) That's a great point. Yes. Sauce should be on the side. Uh, You know, I don't know. I don't know when that that became the, the. The barometer for uh, for smoked meat for that to be it's cooked so long that it falls off the boat. So, yeah, like Applebee's or you know, Benigan's. I think it's or one of those guys. Yeah, standards for all of a sudden what America thinks of barbecue. Mm-hmm. So sad. Um, so they really they really stuck to the Texas style. They really wanted to emulate what was happening down in Austin and in Hill Country and you know, Kreutz and Smitty's and 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 um, all those great places. And so. Um, they really focused on their brisket, um, and it's basically it's. I think it's mostly black pepper and mm-hmm. salt, um, and a little bit of dry rub, but mostly black pepper, like they would in Texas. Thirteen, fourteen hours, give or take. Um, they do a nice job with the ribs. They really have a pronounced smoke ring. Uh, the pit beans are outstanding. Um, the mac and cheese outstanding. I mean, they, everything that they do there is is well thought out. They don't do too much. Um, they do do pork shoulder, and they they pull pork, but um, they don't go crazy with you know offering. 17 different things on the menu yeah. uh brisket sliced or chopped and uh i think they they're would, getting their sausage from texas from tim mckeska from tim mckeska absolutely yeah uh he was just here for the windy city smoke out a couple months ago great guy and he is a great guy and he's supplying um i think their jalapeno and their jalapeno cheddar mm. and they just smoke it here um but yeah that to me that is really i think the pinnacle of, of barbecue right now in chicago but then there's guys like you know, lily's q uh charlie mckenna does a great job he's a competition barbecuer two years ago he and his dad won first place uh pulled pork at memphis in may yeah i so, remember that yeah nothing to slouch at no, right? not at all um and he's been on the competition circuit for years they've got a serious rig i mean you know you've seen these rigs when they're in mm. competition oh, yeah. Um, and he's got the Yeti coolers and he's got the whole offset thing going on and then like a lounge on the, in his trailer, but he does a great job. And he's one of the few, the only guys in town doing tri-tip, which you don't see that Santa Maria style no. anywhere in Chicago. So that's an interesting thing at, at Lily's Q. And Lily's um, Q is a, is a little bit more high end? Yeah, it's a little high end. I mean, it's in Bucktown. It's in a kind of a swankier neighborhood. Um, they do fried chicken. They do a lots of they do a lot of different sauces. I yeah, like their sauces. Their... I see all the time at different supermarkets. Yeah, that's right. They sell those around the country now. They do like an Alabama white sauce, which mm-hmm. is kind of a, you never see anywhere in Chicago. Um, but their their product is also excellent. I think they do a very good job. You know, they're consistent. They've got a really good system down. And Charlie used to work at uh, I think Alinea or, or Trio, one of those high end. Yeah, I want to think he did. Yeah. So he really approaches it from a chef's perspective. Uh, which I think is is unique and rare in that industry. Um, there's another place called Barbecue Supply Company. It's way up on the north side, almost near Evanston. Okay. Uh, this is Jared Wentworth. Uh, used to have it, it was called Rub Backcountry Barbecue. Okay. And I went there twice. I was unimpressed, and I thought it was very inconsistent and, and, and dry, and just lots of problems. And he realized that that they were not really paying attention to it because they were so busy focused on their Nashville hot chicken joint called Budlong. Okay. So he brought in this pit master Dylan uh, Leip, and Dylan has done such a great job. They really focused the menu. They got rid of the commodity pork. They got rid of the average brisket they're now using at Snake River Farms. Oh, that's smart. Brisket. Um, they really are doing a nice job. Duroc pork. pork. Um, they're, they're smoking their cobbler. They're smoking. They've got like a truffled mac. So oh. 
Mm -hmm. It means that a little bit of a touch of sort of um, uh, fine dining, uh, but not to the point where it, it, it's unrecognizable. Okay. And I have just had two great meals there. And so I did a story on them for ABC recently. But they just opened up in Hyde Park on the south side, which is also rare for some of these places to open up on the south side. It's a different audience. It's a lot of college students because University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, um, yeah, Barbecue Supply Company is doing a barbecue great job. Barbecue Supply Company. I'll check them out and I'll, I'll definitely yeah, put a link to them. Do, they do sell sauces and rubs from other places. They've got a private event space. They do pit to table um, events. So it's kind of cool too. And I'll put, also put a link to your story from ABC. Yeah, it aired about two or three weeks ago. Excellent. I missed it. I, I definitely want to check it out. Are there any other places that are kind of popping up that are that might not be on people's radar, radar or places that people should be checking out? Yeah. I, mean, I think Honky Tonk is for sure off of people's radar only because it's in Pilsen, which mm -hmm. is on the near south side. And Pilsen is thought of as a very heavily Mexican-American concentrated um, neighborhood. And there are a lot of great taquerias there. Um, although one guy that I know just opened up an amazing Vietnamese restaurant down on Pilsen. And 18th Street is kind of the main artery. Okay. Um, so, But Honky Tonk, Honky Tonk Barbecue has done a nice job for several years also. And they've, they've managed to build an audience and, again, a lot of it's a lot of the same things, you know, pulled pork um, and ribs, and sometimes you see tips. Tips are mostly just in the aquarium style, south side, deep south side. Uh, most other places are ribs, brisket, pulled pork. So Honky Tonk does a nice job as well. Um, I, I think Gary Wiviet does a great job at bar, at um, oh, yeah, yeah. Barn and Company. Yeah, they are. He's a nice, nice guy. Great guy. He wrote uh, Low and Slow, mm -hmm. uh, two volumes, I believe. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of become a barbecue guru, uh, major domo in Chicago, and he's consulted with other places and helped them out and kind of okay. get them started. And so uh, Barn and Company is another place that's, that's definitely worth a visit. I've had some amazing brisket from him. Um, they do burnt ends as well. You don't see a lot of burnt ends in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Um, I did have some good burnt ends at Mr. B's, which um, is a relatively new barbecue place in Lincoln, in North Center, kind of on the northwest side of the city. Um, again, ribs, tips, brisket. No, no, ribs, ribs, brisket, and burnt ends. Okay. And so, oh, yeah, I would say, you know, Honky Tonk, Mr. B's, Barn and Company, those three you don't hear about as much as the Lily's Q and the Smoke. So do you feel like you're, like there's a better representation of barbecue now in Chicago than there ever was. Like if you really, if you really want to go out and eat some interesting barbecue, you have a chance now. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, when I started in covering food in 95, um, there was nothing. There was Carson's and, um, the twin anchors, which I mentioned earlier. And then a couple places on the South side. And now, I mean, we've got at least a half dozen, I would put up against anybody in the country. And the cool thing is they've done this uh, Windy City Smokeout the last mm -hmm. five, six years. And they're doing a great job with it. And they're bringing in other great pit masters from around the country. But they're also promoting the local guys as well, um, who I think do a great job. Um, it's organized by Let Us Entertain You. So obviously Bub City is a part of it. And Bub City is fine. And they're River North. And they do definitely a, a good job, I think, of barbecue. Uh, but I just... I'd rather go into the neighborhoods and get something a little bit more interesting and more personal. Oh, definitely. And uh, would you say that those those original three would that have been Chicago style if there was a Chicago style barbecue? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the Chicago style now is the smoke and the Lily's Q and uh, and barbecue supply. They just, you know, I, I don't think burnt ends are a part of our discussion here, and that's kind of a, a rarity. And certainly, tri tip is not. But I think you know, sliced brisket. Uh, pulled pork. They've they've definitely adopted the the Carolina style with the, the coleslaw and those sandwiches, and um, I would say tips and and links. And and with uh, with Chicago with regulations, you can't have an offset smoker at a restaurant, right? No, they are so like when I, I saw Smitty's, you know, in Texas, or I've seen Kreutz, like what they're doing, <laughs> like Louis Mueller. Oh like, yeah. That just not exist in Chicago ever. Yeah. Maybe in the suburbs. And there's a guy way out in Palatine, which is a good 45 minute drive from downtown. Um, and I think it's called Chicago. He has, Chicago's in the name for some reason because he said Palatine has no sex appeal. But <laughs> he's only open on the weekends. Now, he could do something because he's way out in the middle of nowhere and not subject to sort of Cook County rules mm -hmm. or Chicago rules. But no, I've not seen any offsets like that. I mean, the stuff in Texas is just so one of a kind. And, and Smoke, are they in a, a, a building? Like I, I remember hearing something that they have their – their smoke comes goes up like a ventilator, or there's some kind of something something really interesting because they are in 
uh, like a five, ten story building? They no smokes in. Oh yes, yeah, so smoke has a second location. Second location. Um, that's what it is. Okay. A loop. Yes, in the revival food hall. And that's a tricky one because you're in the middle of the loop and you can't have just an exhaust. It's a, it's a, at least a 10 story, if not more building. And so they are smoking. He has to go up to the, like, what the top floors and they put a smoker in there with the vent that goes up the, okay. the roof. Yeah. He's not smoking it down on the first floor. He's smoking it upstairs and then bringing it down every day for service. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, that's, I, I need their... They're doing Turkey, which nobody else is doing in town. Oh, okay. I think that's maybe I, you know what? I think I've got this all from you. <laughs> okay. I mean, typically you'd see Turkey like at Franklin or even a lot of places in Austin are doing Turkey now. But yeah. Only that smoke downtown in Chicago is doing Turkey. And when you travel around, do you have any bar- favorite barbecue joints? Do you go across the country that you make sure if you do travel that you make sure you hit? I've always liked uh, Little Joe's Eat It and Beat It in Kansas City. I'm not sure if they're still there. Um, I like Oklahoma Joe's also in Kansas City, although I haven't been there in quite a while. Um, I, I do think, um, Lexington barbecue is, is outstanding. That's um, one of my I, first places that I went to that. I don't like when they put the sauce in the coleslaw and it turns red and it's, it, I, I just, that's not my style of coleslaw. The hush puppies, I can, I can take or leave it. Um, but that shoulder is just incomparable. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, and the, for them, and that location is killer. Location's great. And, um, uh, what else was I going to say? I, I, I think in Texas, you know, I don't need to go to Franklin anymore. I've been there twice. Mm-hmm. I think La Barbecue is outstanding. Oh, I like Nickelthwaite craft meats quite a bit, uh, partly because you're in that little cart in like a little park, mm-hmm. uh, and you're next to like a, a juice smoothie place. But I think their their food is outstanding at Nickelthwaite in Austin. I would definitely make it a point to go back there. Um, and you know, nothing really else. Sort of. I mean, I, a couple places like uh, Mighty Quinn's in New York is good. I should say in the Lower East mm-hmm. Side, Mighty Quinn's was good, um, and uh, Brisket Town. Those are kind of the places I've been. I like. And Brisket Town is sadly uh, gone away for a while. Oh, what? Yeah, Daniel's uh, stopped that. I think he's going to jump back in again, but he's it's gone. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, it's tough business. Yeah, yeah. No, it's no. It's and especially in New York, it's that's that's not easy. Well, so what else? What else should people know about what you're doing right now? So that way they can uh, they can check out everything that you're doing. I think uh, the best thing is just go to stevedolinsky.com. That's my website, and um, I've got a little bar on the top. Uh, people should click to follow what I'm doing. I don't send out that many notices, but like once every other month, I'll send out a little newsletter and say, here's some interesting stories that we recently did on the feed or an interesting piece we did on ABC7 or here's a travel piece I just wrote. Um, I am working on a pizza book. So the pizza book is done. It's at the publisher now. They're working on production. Uh, the title is called Pizza City USA, 101 Reasons Why Chicago is America's Greatest Pizza Town. Oh, nice. And the reasons are twofold. It's one, because we have 10 different styles of pizza here. And the other is that our thin crust is phenomenal. We have a, a, it's called tavern style, Chicago style thin, which is square cut thin and crispy, which you don't see in many places. Um, But just to build up my street cred, over the next 10 months before the book comes out, I'm doing four trips to New York City to eat in 45 different pizza places just to make sure I've covered all my bases. 45, nice. (laughs) Well, you're definitely diligent. That's amazing. You can follow me on Instagram or Twitter on Steve Delinsky uh, with a Y, and they'll be able to follow that uh, progress as well. And, and also on your on, on Twitter as well if they want. Absolutely. Steve Delinsky on Twitter too. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I know we've been trying to, to get this together for a long time. So I thank you for your time, and it's, it's an honor to speak with you. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for your time. All right. Have a great day. Oh, you too.